National and world events kind of forever seem to be on a wild ride, don't they? Uh, just ups and downs constantly. I was thinking that not too awfully long ago, just a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, it sounded like a, a military strike by the United States on Syria was imminent. We were talking days, maybe even hours. And so, you know, like that's going to change everything. And so we were kind of wondering what was going to happen with that. Well, now things are much different. It sounds like Syria has agreed to UN inspections. Sounds like they might even turn over those dreaded chemical weapons they have. And what a change of events. Of course, that's not a done deal yet. So we kind of just hang in there and wait for what's going to happen next. Last week, you might be aware of, Iran, kind of an arch enemy for years, and all of a sudden a new regime is in charge, and the new president uh, is coming out talking about the fact that they do not have plans for nuclear weapons. Wow, I'm surprised, because they've been talking about nuclear weapons for a long time, and it sounds like uh, they want to make things better with uh, themselves in the United States. And so that's kind of an interesting development. Again, we'll just kind of have to wait and see how that turns out. Thinking here in the United States, as you know, last week, a week of violence, which is increasingly familiar. A gunman goes in and kills 12 people in the Washington, D.C. Navy Yard. And then later in the week, we find out a gunman opens fire in Chicago, and there are 13 that are injured there. And unfortunately, we're getting much too used to hearing that kind of news about mass shootings. Devastating flood in Colorado that leaves several people dead, literally billions of dollars in damage, an unprecedented natural disaster. We also hear about devastating tropical storms on both coasts down in Mexico and lots of tourists that are stranded there. And, and the list goes on. That's just the latest developments of the wild events that characterize the age that we live in. I think a hurricane kind of serves as an illustration of the way it is in this age. And I'm thinking there's an application that might be encouraging, I hope is encouraging to us as we think about it. Of course, you know a hurricane is one of nature's most violent storms. Uh, I've never been in one. I hope I never will be. And I guess it's probably a safe bet in Arizona from all I've heard. I don't re recall ever reading about a hurricane here. So probably if we're expecting to experience one in Arizona, that's not likely to happen. But what we know about hurricanes, whether we've ever been in one or not, is right smack in the middle of it, there is this eye, as it is called. And apparently, if you could be in a hurricane and just be in the eye, it's perfectly calm and safe there. So I guess the trick is, if you could get in the eye when the storm comes, I don't know how that works, if you get in there and just sort of travel with it, you're really unaffected by the storm because you're in that very center where it's peaceful and where it's calm and you avoid all the devastating effects of that storm. I'm thinking that in this present age, there is a storm much like a hurricane that is ever swirling around us. Again, just gave you some of the latest developments in the world in this nation, but it is an ongoing storm. That's just a characteristic of the age, and, and that storm is going to intensify as we come near to the time of the end, but for the people of God, and I think this is the most encouraging thing, is we have the privilege to be in the eye of the storm. And I think that's the place where God wants us to be in a, in a place of peace and calm while the storm revolves around us. Having said that, I want you to look in your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. There may be a certain irony to that because you talk about storms. Revelation is the ultimate storm, isn't it? You talk about the events that you see in the book of Revelation. If anything's going to disturb you, this book is certainly going to do that. You think about all the disturbing visions of widespread death and disease and war and natural disasters, this evil tyrant, the Antichrist, all these extremely disturbing images that characterize the book of Revelation. And if you get hung up on those things, that's certainly going to take peace away from you. But I, I don't want us to go there this morning. I want us to focus in chapter 1, because chapter 1, and I just gained a fresh appreciation of this chapter, there's tremendous encouragement and peace in this first chapter. I want you to look at the first three verses. The writer, John the Apostle, he says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants 
the things which must soon take place. And he, and, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. Again, you think of Revelation. And you think of it as a book of those vivid images, disturbing images. But we are told right at the very beginning that this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revealing of Jesus, the Son of God, which God, His Father, gave to Him to show to His bondservants, in other words, to us. God gave this to His Son to reveal His Son to us, His people. It is a revelation not so much about future events, and this is, I think, the breath of fresh air for me at least. This is not so much about the future events, prophecy events. This is about the Son of God being revealed to us. God wants us to understand it, to know His Son. I'm reminded in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, that the hidden things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things, the revelation, belongs to us and our children forever. What God wants to reveal. God has given that to us for all time. And what God has given to us for all time is to know and understand His Son better, to reveal His Son to us. That is God's great gift to us, is to reveal His Son progressively to each one of us, His children. So again, we don't want to get overly hung up on all the visions of this prophecy in the book of Revelation. We don't want to get hung up on anything else that would prevent us from seeing Jesus as God intends for us to see Him. Again, it is a revelation. And revelation literally means to take the cover off of something. I'm picturing a storage room. And I'm picturing a, a tarp over some objects that's been there for a long time. And maybe given the key to go into this storage room and to, and to find what it is that's been covered up for so long, covered with dust. Pulling that tarp off of it and seeing something underneath that's amazing and valuable, worthwhile. That's what revelation is. That's what God is doing concerning His Son. It's like the tarp is being pulled off. And we're able to see this, um, this amazing treasure, which is His Son. God wants us to know His Son better. But also this passage speaks about the things which must soon take place. Verse 3 also talks about the time being near. I've read those verses many times, and I immediately concluded that it indicates the, the near return of Christ. That's a part of it, but that may not be entirely accurate. The things that must soon take place, and the time that is near is the beginning of a series of events that, as you and I know, have gone on for over 2,000 years. But as it was revealed to John, it was the beginning of those events, these last days that we live in. And so this book is about revealing those things to us. And we're told in verse 3 that we are blessed if we read these words, and if we hear these words, and if we heed or pay attention to these words. There are no words in Scripture more difficult to try to wrap our minds around. How many people have rolled up their sleeves and tried to understand the book of Revelation? There's so many confusing different interpretations and possibilities. It is a rather mysterious book. And we're not told that we're blessed if we understand it. I don't see that anywhere in verse 3. But I know that we are blessed if we take time to read it, if we hear others read it, and if we take seriously what is written therein. Whether we understand it or not, there are blessings within this book. And what an amazing thing. And so in verse 4, John talks about him writing these words to seven churches in a certain region of Asia. And I read that and I think seven churches. This was the beginning of the church age. Were there only seven churches back at that time? No, there's a lot of evidence to indicate there were many other churches. So what's the deal with seven? They're kind of special. Why did they get singled out? Why just these particular seven? And again, there's lots of theories and thoughts concerning why the seven. But one thing that seems to make a lot of sense to me, whenever I read the number seven, I know that's a number of completion. 
And so it seems like perhaps we have seven churches here that represent believers every time and in every place. And so seven churches that typify believers everywhere at any particular time. So that includes us. And so here is a sevenfold message to us even down in this day and age, even as it was to those people at that time. And we're told that this message has a connection with seven spirits. Again, that significant number. Seven spirits before the throne of God, or we might say sevenfold spirit, which I personally believe just represents that dynamic power of God that created all that exists. And so it is a message from God our Father. It is empowered by the Spirit of God. It is a revealing of the Son of God that He wants us to understand. And so in verses 5 and 6, it is from Jesus Christ. And I love the description of who He is here. He is called the faithful witness. He is called the firstborn from among the dead indeed. Resurrected to immortality by His Father. He's the very first one, the precedent of others, 1 Corinthians 15. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. I'm not sure why I didn't see that phrase as clearly before, but I've recently seen that, and I lift that up because there's tremendous encouragement there. It sounds like the rulers of the world and of the nations are, are doing whatever it is they want to do, but I'm reminded that Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings and the leaders of the earth. To Him who loves us and released us from our sins by His blood. What a tremendous promise. He has loved us so much as to lay His life down voluntarily for us. And in having so doing, dying that death upon the cross, He has released us from our sins. Released us from our sins. I love that because of the guilt that I so often carry concerning sin. I'm released from that, I'm told here by this Jesus. And, and He has made us to be a kingdom and priest to His God and Father. And so to Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Tremendous things said about Jesus and what He's doing for us, His people. The center of the hurricane, the eye of the storm, the calm place. These are truths that we hold on to while things rage around us. This is who He is and this is what He's doing with us. And this is the privileged status that we have in Him. When I'm thinking about what He's done and what He's doing, and on Wednesday nights we've been studying the book of Hebrews. What a blessing that has been. I'm seeing that book like I've never seen it before. Realizing the completed work of Christ and a fresh appreciation of how people in another age tried so hard to deal with the problem of sin. God outlined what needed to happen for sin. The, the animals you had to bring, the, the grain offerings, the drink offerings, all those kinds of things. The continuous activity of people then that tried to please God, bringing the best of their flock to the temple and having it killed to cover their sin. Not to release them from it, but simply to cover them concerning their sin and to remind them of the problem of sin. And what a, a helpless and burdensome situation. It, there was never a solution in that. But the solution now is in Jesus Christ who has released us from our sins by His blood. Not the blood of those animals. By His blood once and for all. Who is now set down at the right hand of God working on our behalf. What a tremendous encouragement. Verse 7. Behold, He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see Him. Even those who pierced Him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over Him. So it is to be. Amen. I like that note of certainty. This is not wishful thinking. Behold, He's coming with the clouds. That's how He left. In the first chapter of Acts, it talks about the fact that this Jesus who was taken up will come back in the same way that you've seen Him go into heaven. Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and somehow every eye is going to see Him when He comes back, even down to those who were guilty of putting Him to death. Somehow, again, I don't understand it, but somehow they will see that, and the nations of the earth are going to be rather upset because their reign of terror will be over. The nations will mourn in regret and remorse when He comes back. But indeed... It will be so. So it will be. Amen. 
he reminds us here, this is an established fact. It's going to happen. Jesus Christ is coming back. We stake a claim in that, don't we? Amen? We believe he's coming back. We don't know when. And we are not going to make the mistake that others have done in bygone years to, to calculate it all out and say, he's got to come back on this particular date. No man knows the day nor the hour. It is absurd to speculate. We don't know the date, and we will not pretend that we do, but this much is certain. There is a date. God Almighty has established it on a calendar, and it will happen because it is on the calendar. And so whether in our lifetime or not doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is it is an event and He is coming back and that is our hope because when He comes back, if we are alive, we'll be changed. If we sleep the sleep of death, we'll be brought up to immortality. And what a blessing. That is our blessed hope, literally. So John says in verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker... And notice what it is he's a brother and a fellow partaker in. In the tribulation, secondly, the kingdom, and in perseverance, which are in Jesus. And he says he's on an island called Patmos, Patmos because of the word of God and testimony of Jesus. And so he partakes in three things that are common in Jesus Christ. At least one of those we like a lot, the other two not so much so. In Christ... He is a partaker of tribulation. That's why he was on the island in the first place, because he went on to say, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, got himself in some hot water because he represented faithfully his Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's banished in exile to that island. So he knows about tribulation, but that's a part of it in Christ. The second one we like a lot, he's a partaker in the kingdom, in the reign of God, in the coming government that's going to be established upon the earth. And so he's a partaker in that. We like to just kind of stop and focus on that, but also a partaker in perseverance. Perseverance, the stick to the hang-in-there quality. And that ought to mean something to us as well. Again, let's be in that eye of that storm where it's peaceful and calm, where God wants us to be, and let's persevere there. Let's share in the perseverance that John shared in, that we continue on, that we are faithful, no matter what is ahead of us, even if it would be death for the cause of Christ, that we share also with John in that perseverance. When I think about what he says here concerning those three qualities, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul and how he went around to the churches that he helped found in Acts chapter 14, verse 22. It says that he went around strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying this, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Sounds much like what John has to say as well. He encouraged them with those words. I don't know that I find those words terribly encouraging, but there's a note of realism. So there's encouragement in that. That is the way it is. We are partakers in those things, and so we hang in there. Because we belong to a kingdom that will be worth it all when it's said and done. And so we persevere until that time. And yes, if there's tribulation, we will endure it. And we will overcome through Jesus Christ because of that. So we're told in verses 9 to 11 that John is exiled to a little island called Patmos. And he says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Caught up by God's Spirit in the Lord's day. Does that mean it was Sunday? Does that mean it was Saturday? We don't know. It might even mean he was caught up in the Spirit to the ultimate Lord's day. He was kind of caught up into the end time, even to the kingdom age, perhaps. We don't know. We can speculate on that. But he had this, this spirit event that happened in his life. And he was caught up to see certain things. And those things that he saw, he was called upon to distribute them to those seven churches that we just talked about. Now, verses 12 to 16 maybe the most exciting part of this chapter. I'm not going to read those verses, but I want you to scan down through there. And I want you to notice that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, saw Jesus. And he saw Jesus like he had never seen him before. Again, here's the man who knew him better than anyone else during the earthly ministry of Christ. And now he turns because he hears a voice. He turns, verses 12 to 16, and he sees this Jesus described thusly here. And you know, it, it's hard to get your mind around what it is that he sees because he doesn't look at anything like he did while he walked upon the earth. This is the glorified Christ. 
the Christ who's now at the right hand of God. And it's almost nondescript in what we read here. But again, it is the Jesus that he knew while he walked the earth, the Jesus who's now glorified. And then in verse 17, and this is especially interesting in light of the fact that John knew him better than anyone else, when I saw him, he says, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades, the grave. John, of all people, to be afraid of Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved, had the most intimate relationship with him during the earthly ministry of Jesus. And when he saw that image, he fell down like a dead man, absolutely terrified at the vision that he saw. But note the reassuring touch of Jesus Christ as he placed his hand upon him. I am the living one. I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm the beginning and the end of the plan of God. I was dead, but behold, I'm alive forever. That This could not have been God then, could it? Because God alone possesses immortality. So there's no doubt who it is he's seeing here is his Lord Jesus Christ, placing his hand on his shoulder and reminding him of those great truths. And he goes on and he tells him what it is that he's to do. Therefore, write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. And then finally, the very last verse, he talks about a mystery of seven stars that we read in this chapter. And stars that, that you saw in his right hand and, and seven golden lampstands described earlier. And he says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. What I understand of that is Jesus says, I hold you, the church, in my hand. And I stand among you, the church. I'm in your midst, and I hold you in my good right hand. That also is tremendously encouraging as we read those words. And so, looking at this entire chapter, I lift it up for us today to be encouraged by, because never mind the disturbing images in the other chapters. Let's think about this and think about the encouragement for us. In the storms of this age, in the eye of the storm, there is that peace and encouragement as we think on the great truths that we've just looked at here. Again, we live in an age when God is revealing His Son to us. God gave Him, Jesus, to show these things to us, His bondservants, His people. And so we want to see even more clearly this glorified Christ at the right hand of God. We want to look at verses 12 to 16 and try to get our minds around that and visualize that even more because that's who Jesus is now. Not the Jesus of Bethlehem, not the Jesus of Calvary, but the Jesus exalted at the right hand of God. We want to see Him more clearly and understand more because God wants to reveal Him to us. And again, we see Him as the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amidst the storm of government upheaval and leaders posturing and gesturing and all the kinds of things they do, we are reminded that God has ultimately put Jesus Christ in charge. As he says, sit at my right hand, Psalm 110.1, sit at my right hand till I make all the enemies a footstool under your feet. And so, again, we are reminded that it is Jesus who is in charge, not the United States President or Congress or the House of Representatives or the Head of Parliament or a prime minister, or the dictatorial kings of the earth. None of them are in charge, even though they think they are. God has designated His Son to be in charge of all. Again, we know He is coming with the clouds. It's been a long time. I cannot imagine that John the Apostle would have imagined over 2,000 years. But it's been over 2,000 years, and Jesus has not yet come. And it could be another 2,000 years, or it could be in two minutes. We don't know. We, again, will not speculate. But nevertheless, He is coming with the clouds. We are told at the very end of the book of Revelation, three times, Jesus says that I am coming quickly. And you know, I've read those words and thought coming quickly means coming soon, but that's not the same word. Coming quickly means that when I come, boy, is it going to happen fast. But he didn't say, I was going to come back in the lifetime of John or Paul or in our lifetime. But I'm telling you, most assuredly, that when I come, it's going to be quick. It will happen very, very fast when that time comes. Again, in the meantime, we are like the, the seven churches. We are in his good right hand. And we're like the lampstands. He is in our midst. 
that ought to be tremendously encouraging to us as we've gathered here this morning. He is in our midst. He is holding us, the believers, in His right hand. And whatever storm rages around us, He's got us and He's with us. I don't know about you, but that's good enough for me. Whatever may come, as long as I'm in His hand, and as long as He's standing in our midst, then that's good enough. And that's what we hold to as we look for Him to come. And we do again remind ourselves, He will come back. And we want to be ready. We want to be vigilant in the meantime. But nevertheless, right now, we're in the center of that storm where He holds us and He lifts us up. I think that God wants us to be even more focused on this revelation of Jesus Christ, His faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. God's plan is well underway. And it is not threatened by any government or any leader. It is underway. And again, we are comforted and encouraged in the midst of things, even great upheaval. We are encouraged by these great truths that we've just looked at. And so thus we can declare, and I want you to declare with me, the last of verse 6. Let's make that our confident declaration today. I printed the words, I believe, in the outline. And I think it is good for us to say, even as John said, to Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's save those words and, and take our confident stand today as we do so. In fact, maybe it would just be good if we stood as we said those words. And having said them, we'll ask our worship team to come up and lead us in that closing song. But let's make that declaration very confidently today as we looked at these great truths. Verse 6, ready? To Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And a